Welcome to Premise Podcast. This is your host, Angelo Sofocleus. In this episode, I have the pleasure of hosting Professor Cecil Fabre, a professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford. We talk about her book Cosmopolitan War, more specifically the chapters on wars of subsistence and wars of humanitarian intervention. Among other topics, we differentiate between the right and the duty to wage war, analyze who has the authority to wage a war and under what conditions, and explore whether it is ever permissible to kill non-combatants in a war. Cecil Fabre is a professor of political philosophy at the University of Oxford and a senior research fellow at All Souls College, Oxford. She has published extensively on the areas of political philosophy, the ethics of war, the ethics of peace, theories of justice, and the ethics of foreign policy. In 2011, she was elected a fellow of the British Academy. Welcome everyone to this episode of Premise Podcast. Today with me, I have the pleasure to have Cecil Fabre. Welcome to Premise Podcast, Professor Fabre. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So today I would like to talk to you about your book, Cosmopolitan War. Uh Uh-huh. You, I know you do a lot of work on the ethics of war and you have written uh, these two books amongst many other books and uh, papers, Cosmopolitan War and Cosmopolitan Peace. Today I would like to focus on Cosmopolitan War. Okay. And specifically about the chapters on humanitarian intervention and subsistence wars. Okay. So let's start with the book itself. Um, what was the motivation for writing this book and what are the general ideas that you wanted to present in the book Cosmopolitan War? Okay, so um, I think I have two um, kinds of motivation. Um, you know, bearing in mind that you know, the book came out in 2012, um, I started, you know, working on it, you know, solidly in about 2007, so it's a long time ago. But nevertheless, um, there were two two rationales really uh, for the book. So the first one, you know, um, had to do with where I had got at in my philosophical trajectory, you know, by that point. Um, so I started my life and career, as it were, as a political philosopher by writing in my doctoral thesis about uh, duties of assistance in general and welfare rights in, in particular. So about the views that you know, um, those who are in a position to help the needy are under duties of justice, you know, to do so. Uh, And then I started thinking, well, there are many ways in which um, we might be in a position to help people in need. So the most obvious example, the one we are very familiar with, is by giving them money, you know, through taxation, for example. But sometimes, you know, someone might need my help in a very different kind of way. And here the classic example is Peter Singer's you know, case whereby I happen to walk past a pond, a child is at risk of drowning. And here, if I am under a duty to provide assistance, and I assume that I am, uh, then it's not going to be discharged by my giving money. You know, to the child, it's going to be discharged by my providing a service or mm-hmm. by my using my body in a particular way you know, to use to lift you know the child you know, out of the pond. So that was my second book, part of my second book, which had to do with our rights and duties in respect of our own body. And then I thought, but you know, hold on a sec. Um, sometimes um, the the help that other people need, you know, will take the form of an act of killing. So if you are under threat from an attacker, and if you are going to die unless I kill that attacker, let's suppose that I'm a bystander, I'm on the scene, I have a gun, if the only way for you to survive is for me to kill the attacker, if I would be under a duty to give you money to save you from dying from starvation, or if I'm under a duty to use my body in such a way to save you from drowning, Does it not follow that I'm under a duty to kill your attacker to help you? And I wrote a paper about this, a a standalone paper, and then I thought, oh, but now this has really interesting implications for war, Um, so for war in general and wars of humanitarian intervention 
you know, in particular. So, so that's the first, you know, motivation. I had got to the point, you know, in my philosophical thinking, you know, where that question was just unavoidable, really. I had to address it. It followed, you know, from more or less everything I had done, you know, before. But the second motivation was somewhat different. So, um, you know, I have long had the view, in fact, I don't remember ever not holding the view that uh, whatever duties are strong, you know, duties of justice we have, we have them not merely to fellow compatriots, but to distant strangers you know, as well. In other words, I, I don't think there ever was a time when I was not a cosmopolitan. Now, war is interesting because we tend to frame it as a matter of us versus them. And that relationship that structures us on the one hand, and that structures them on the other hand, tends to be construed by opinion to patriotic or indeed nationalistic you know, norms. And I never have been a pacifist. So then I thought, OK, so what would a cosmopolitan you know, theory of war look like? I mean, what happens if we start from the view that the scope of justice is universal and if we are faced with a political and social phenomenon, which in very important ways you know, seems to be in tension you know, with universal cosmopolitan norms. And plus, roughly at that time, you know, I read um, Simon Keynes' book, you know, Justice Beyond Borders. Um, he's a cosmopolitan. He has a chapter on war. And I thought, OK, this is interesting. I think there is scope you know, for writing a full monograph you know, on this. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. This will certainly... Will Sorry, that was, a slightly long, that was a slightly long answer, so you should feel free to cut me off. No, no worries. These are issues we will certainly expand on uh, later. Okay. Um, so before getting to the more specifics of, of the book, how could we define cosmopolitanism? So there's a, a tripartite you know, distinction in the literature of cosmopolitanism between you know, cultural cosmopolitanism, moral, moral cosmopolitanism and political cosmopolitanism. Um, I don't really talk in that book about cultural cosmopolitanism. My concern is with the moral and political view that, to repeat, uh, the scope of justice transcends national borders. In other words, you know, the fact that you are from Cyprus and the fact that I'm French is completely irrelevant to my fundamental duties of justice, you know, to you. And I take that to be at the core of moral cosmopolitanism. Political cosmopolitanism could be regarded as or described as the view that in order to bring about moral cosmopolitanism, we should all work towards the um, establishment of international political institutions, you know, whose jurisdiction, therefore, by implication, transcends in you know, national borders, and which should be given the resources to help us implement at the very least, but perhaps even enforce our cosmopolitan duties of justice to one another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. So when we talk about subsistence rights in uh, referring to the specific chapter in your book, how can we define subsistence rights? And when do you think that a violation of subsistence rights uh, provides victims with a just cause for war? Good. So, so by subsistence rights, I mean rights to the basic necessities of life, um, you know, food, shelter, minimum income, you know, basic level of health care, you know, and so on. So, you know, the rights which are enshrined in various international you know, declarations and, uh, and covenants. Now, in the book, I argue that there are uh, three grounds you know, for, in support of the view that violations of those rights can be regarded as a just cause, you know, for war. Um, so the first argument um, is one that we find, interestingly enough, in uh, Hugo Grotius, you know, in particular, where he argues that the right of necessity, that is to say the right to what we need in order to survive, um, imposes a duty on the part of third parties not to appropriate more than their fair share. So not to seize so much, for example, by way of natural resources, that I would have nothing left you know, to subsist on. 
And Grotius argues, and I agree with him, that you know, violations of that duty, the duty not to take more than what I need, and not to take to such a degree that you would be left without what you need, violations of that duty can be regarded as a just cause for war. So if you are the wronged in a party, by so acting, I provide you with a justification for resorting to force in order to recover from me what I have wrongfully taken, what does not belong to me, but what in fact you know, ought to have been available you know, for you to appropriate. Um, there is a second, you know, justification which goes like this. Well, you know, subsistence rights, or rather, our interests in basic subsistence, can be protected by two kinds of rights: rights that other people do not act in such a way as to make it impossible, you know, for us to achieve subsistence in a level. So these are <clears throat> rights that correlate with negative duties. And one of the most famous proponents of that thesis is Thomas Foggy. And on that view, violations of negative duties, duties not to act in such a way as to make it impossible you know, for people to achieve basic subsistence levels, can provide a just cause you know, for war. And in the book, I argue by way of showing that there is something deeply counterintuitive about um, the opposite view. So let me explain how the argument works. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the assumption that most people would take for granted that you know, violations of the right to collective self-determination and the right to territorial integrity are just causes for war. So on that view, by invading the Falkland Islands, Argentina did provide Great Britain with a just cause for war. That's you know, fairly you know, straightforward. Now, suppose someone were to accept that straightforward claim on the one hand, but on the other hand, deny that acting in such a way to harm people's prospects for subsistence also provides a just cause. Well, to hold that two-pronged view, so Falklands, yes, but in a mass starvation case, no, would in effect say that violation of rights to territorial integrity of a, a fairly tiny territory do provide a justification for the resort to war, but you know, violations of the right to subsistence on a mass scale does not. And I just find that completely counterintuitive. It seems to me that the values which underpin both territorial rights on the one hand and subsistence rights on the other hand, well-being, freedom, autonomy, and so on, you know, are the values to which we can appeal in order to say, in both cases, there is a just cause you know, for all. And finally, the third argument I deploy is somewhat different. It says, well, look, you know, our interests in subsistence are not protected just by negative duties or negative rights that other people not harm us. They are also protected by positive rights that others provide us you know, with the resources to achieve the subsistence levels. And I argue that violations of positive rights or positive duties can provide a just cause for the resort to force in general and lethal force in particular. Mm -hmm. So following from what you said, can we make the distinction between a wrongful action and the wrongful omission? Um, I'm thinking a real life scenario where someone actually harms another person or fails to help another person when they have a duty to help that person or failing to help that person when they don't have a duty yeah, good. to help that individual. Uh, okay, so, so there, are two, um, there are two different ways of constraining your point. But so let, let me see whether I've got you right. So, I mean, I think it's an interesting challenge because um, if, if one thinks, as in fact I do, that, you know, other things roughly equal, 
killing someone is morally worse than letting them die, then it seems that the account of subsistence wars I have just given does not quite fit, you know, with that. Because on that account, it seems that wrongfully letting someone die, for example, by not giving them the food they need in order not to starve, will be met or can be met with the same response, i.e. war, as violations of the right, you know, not to be killed. And that seems you know, strange. Uh, and I take it that you had something like that, you know, mm-hmm. in mind. And I do, I do accept, you know, the force um, of the, uh, you know, of the challenge. Um, I mean, it seems to me that um, the claim that um, someone commits a worse wrongdoing by doing X than by doing Y, or failing to do Y, does not entail that those failures can never be met, you know, with the same, you know, response. So, you know, there, there might be cases, for example, where um, in, in, you know, accounts of punishment, um, you know, there might be cases where we will want to say that, you know, committing a particular harm, you know, is serious enough to warrant, um, you know, a particular sentence. Um, and that failing to prevent that harm you know, from occurring, although perhaps a less serious, nevertheless, for good independent reasons, can also be met you know, with this particular you know, sentence. Um, and what I try and say in the book is, well, look, um, quite often duties to provide assistance will have to be discharged by several people you know, acting together. And it seems to me that when we are faced with multiple culpable bad you know, Samaritans, um, and if there is a way of forcing enough of those bad Samaritans to do their duty by killing or threatening to kill one of them, then it seems to me that in some cases we might be justified you know, in doing so when the life you know, of the victim you know, is at stake. And that, it seems to me, is compatible with the view that it is morally worse for people together to kill another than for people together to fail to save the life of another person, other things equal. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? Yeah, that's very clear to me. Thank you. So, just to understand your point better, and perhaps there is some more background in there, is your argument that the main reason of why subsistence wars are just wars, is it that the right to not have your subsistence rights violated is basically because they are a violation of human rights and not uh, because of political, of losing political sovereignty? So I think that's a very interesting question. Um, Yes and no. So I do think that, and in fact I argue in the book, that um, uh, to the extent that undermining a political community's rights to self-determination can provide a just cause for war, and to the extent that failing to help that political community achieve subsistence levels might jeopardise you know, its ability meaningfully to exercise its right to collective self-determination, and by implication, that failure to provide them the resources that they need can be regarded as a just cause for war. But I also um, think that even if the connection I have just established between uh, meeting, you know, subsistence, respecting subsistence rights on the one hand, and collective self-determination on the other hand, even if that connection did not exist in in the way that I've just suggested, uh, violations of subsistence rights would in itself, if you will, irrespective of self-determination, provide under certain conditions a just cause for war. In that case, in having these people's human rights violated, so they might wage a subsistence war because they have their human rights violated, could we consider a subsistence war to be equal to self-defense? Yes, I think I think it might be a good way to construe it, um, where you know, um, where self-defense is construed not just as a response to a kinetic, you know, attack, so you know, an attack that takes the form of 
another agent, be it an individual or a set of individuals, moving, as it were, towards me with guns, or crossing the border um, in, a, in, a, in a tank or uh, crossing into airspace. So not just a kinetic attack, but a non-kinetic attack, such as you know, withholding you know, resources, life-saving resources to which one has a right, for example. Yeah, so it's not always a reaction to an armed attack. It could be... Correct, yeah. Yeah. So in waging this war, the question is raised on who has, who has the authority yeah, good. to good. wage such a war. I mean, we, it might be the people of a country that are uh, affected, but their regime, their government might not be able to yeah. wage the war itself, or it might be that they live in a dictatorship. So who is who is granted authority to wage? Well, uh, this is again, this is this is another very good um, and actually very difficult, you know, question. So I, I don't have, um, I still don't have a fully well, you know, sought out, fully sought out and developed answer, you know, to that question. I mean, the first thing to say is that um, I don't think that the issue arises just you know, with subsistence, you know, wars. Um, it also arises with other kinds of war. In fact, I suspect we will encounter it when we talk about humanitarian you know, intervention. Um, so the question of third party uh, involvement, you know, arises for all kinds of wars, not just subsistence wars. What slightly complicates the issue with subsistence wars is that um, quite often those who are derelict in their duties of um, assistance to the very poor will be members of the regime or you know, wealthy citizens you know, in that political you know, community, of whom it might be said that they clearly you know, lack the authority, should they be so inclined, to wage that kind of war against foreign you know, countries, which are also derelict in their duties of assistance to those, you know, um, uh, to their fellow you know, citizens. Um, so that being said, um, I advocate in the book, not just in this case, but in the case of humanitarian intervention, you know, a form of political cosmopolitanism, which I called heavily qualified, you know, multilateralism. So, you know, on the view I try to uh, defend, we are under a duty of justice, all of us together to work towards and support the establishment of just, you know, institutions. Uh, international you know, institutions, um, part of whose mandate you know, would be to enforce those duties of justice. Um, and so you know, within those sets of structures, I mean, I haven't worked out the exact institutional you know, details um, because, I mean, this is a task, I think, more for political scientists than political philosophers, but the hope would be that, you know, within um, those institutions, there would be mechanisms for the authoritative dischargement of the right and the duty to enforce on all parties the primary duties of cosmopolitan justice that we owe you know, to one another. There is one question which I don't address you know, in the book, which I haven't really spent any time you know, thinking about, um, and that's um, you know, the issue of uh, um, activism uh, with an H. So, um, you know, suppose that a group of hackers, you know, would be in a position to hack into the central banks of very wealthy countries, uh, countries whose populations and regimes are clearly derelict by my lights in their duties of assistance to the very poor, countries which are so unwilling to do anything about that. So, you know, would those activists be morally justified in a sort of modern Robin Hood, you know, scenario, you know, in hacking into the banks and, you know, diverting, you know, resources away? I mean, there are some people who are working on this. I, I don't have a clear account of vigilantism, but I do think that we need to start thinking about this term quite seriously. Um, it's much easier for... You know, individuals acting on their own, in some respects, you know, these days, to take matters into their own hands, you know, on behalf of um, of third parties, you know, of other people. So, yeah, it's definitely something that we need to consider, especially as military tactics change, uh, yes. like yes. It might change to yes. bio wars or digital wars. Yes, that's right. Um, well, so there is there is an interesting example which. Um, 
I wasn't really aware of it enough at the time. I mean, I was aware of it because I've read in, about it in the newspapers, but I didn't really twig. So it's the, um, the large-scale denial-of-service uh, attack which Estonia uh, was subject to in 2007. So over the course of two or three weeks, um, hackers basically uh, had paralyzed, you know, Estonia's cyber infrastructure, you know, civilian cyber infrastructure. Now, you know, responsibility for the attack was never fully claimed, but it is widely believed that the attackers were largely a bunch of pro-Russia individual hackers who were upset at the Estonian government's decision to relocate a Soviet-era memorial, you know, away from the capital. Now, Many people think that they would not have been able to do what they did if Russia itself had not somehow sanctioned you know, the operation. But it's an interesting example because it shows the destructive power you know, nowadays, which you know, individuals with particular skin sets acting on their own can cause to well-established domestic, um, uh, civilian, financial, economic and political structures. Coming towards the end of discuss this chapter, yeah. uh, now two questions which might be uh, the same question. So, what are the ethics of killing non-combatants in a subsistence war? And is that related to the principle of civilian immunity? That yeah, so, so that, that's, that's um, you know, one of the most difficult um, questions raised, I think, by this particular chapter. So, uh, on the account of justice, which I developed, affluent members of uh, any society, but in particular of affluent society, so that includes me, are in some important respects derelict, um, or many of them are derelict, you know, in their obligations of justice to distant strangers. For example, because they failed to vote for political parties, which would, if in power, raise taxes in such a way as to increase the size of you know, overseas aid budgets and so on and so forth. So um, does it follow that you know, those uh, individuals are liable to being killed you know, in a uh, subsistence war? Um, and I try to say in the book that it doesn't, you know, any more than it doesn't follow from the fact that you know, a civilian gives some support or fails to object to her regime's decision to wage an unjust war, that he or she should be liable to being killed, to be treated as a legitimate you know, target you know, in the course of that war. So the, the complicated question here is that of the degree to which one's contribution to a participation in an injustice, a grievous injustice, um, makes oneself liable to losing one's life, you know, for the sake of remedying um, that, um, you know, that injustice. Um, that question is merely an illustration of the much broader question, namely what counts as a proportionate, you know, resort to um, inner to force. Um, and it's one area of practical ethics where it's very, very difficult to come up, it seems to me, with general non-vacuous and non-arbitrary principles. I do think that it has to be looked at on a case-by-case basis. Good. So now moving to the humanitarian intervention chapter. Well, a predictable, uh, expected question to start with. Uh, how can we define humanitarian intervention? Yeah, good. So I take a humanitarian intervention to be um, one in which, so in the pure case, as it were, you know, one in which the intervening party um, uh, locates its reason for intervening in um, the fact that the population or a section of the population is subject to very serious rights violations at the hands of its own you know, regime. Now, I call this the pure case to contrast it with a mix or hybrid case whereby the intervening party intervenes not just for the sake of you know, the victims of a rights violating regime, but also because it itself has an interest you know, in that regime, as it were, not being allowed 
you know, to continue to act as it does. And so the a classic example of a mixed case is India's intervention in East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, in, in the 1970s, where as a result of, you know, very repressive uh, you know, policies going to come out of Pakistan, millions of refugees started crossing the border, you know, into India, which had a massively destabilizing impact, you know, on this part of India. So, so that's the, that's the hybrid case. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, I've seen uh, a subsistence war, and I believe any, any kind of war, we can also differentiate between the duty to wage such a war and the right to wage yes, such a war. Mm-hmm. Can we make that distinction and uh, how can we be sure that the one who has the duty to wage a war um, also has the right or vice versa? That, okay, that's good. So so um, most people believe, not everyone, so one of my colleague here in Oberman at the University of Edinburgh would disagree with me here, but um, you know, most people of whom I am, you know, believe that um, the fact that I'm morally permitted to do something, to do X um, uh, in general, and in particular to provide you, you know, with assistance, um, does not entail that I am under a duty, you know, to do so. And the main reason why I believe that there is a difference um, is because duties are subject to costs. So if, for example, you are trapped in a burning building and if the only way for you to survive is for me you know, to go into the burning building and get you out, uh, if, however, I would um, lose my life or if there is a very, very high risk that I would lose my life, and on the assumption that I'm not, you know, someone who has undertaken, you know, to do something like this, I'm not a firefighter, well then, most people would argue that I'm not under a duty to go in and save you. Um, I mean, there are, there are variants of the scenario where I might be under a duty to do it, if, for example, I culpably locked you, you know, into that building, but suppose I haven't. Now, most people would argue that I'm not under a duty to go and save you, but if I want to, I am morally permitted, I would not wrong you, I would not wrong myself, you know, by going in, assuming that you consent, you know, to being, to being helped. Um, now, I argue that the same line of argument can be made, you know, in the case of humanitarian intervention, uh, humanitarian intervention is costly on interveners. It's uh, financially costly. Um, it's uh, costly in terms of the time and energy that it demands of policymakers. But it's also costly in terms of soldiers' lives. And one can imagine cases where a political community would not be under a duty to incur, you know, those sorts of costs, but might be willing you know, to do so, in which case it would be permitted to intervene, though not under a duty to do so. Okay, so one interesting question here is, when does an authority figure have a just cause for intervening? And more more specifically, the question is, do you think one is justified to intervene in in order to prevent something from happening? So... Let's say um, an evil dictator takes over a country, but they still haven't done anything to yeah. harm the citizens. Or in, in real terms, uh, let's say we imagine Germany in the 1930s with the rise of uh, Nazism. Do you think that other countries were justified in um, intervening in Germany? Yeah, so, so in something? Germany, it depends. Um, well, so there's an interesting question with the German case as to when, um, 1933, 1934. Um, a, a more recent example which might help us you know, think about this a bit, you know, would be the Rwandan genocide, um, which started in April 1994. But um, we now know that it was pretty clear in the months leading up you know, to the beginning of the genocide that Western countries knew, and France in particular, you know, knew exactly what was, you know, about to, um, you know, to happen. Not only did France not do anything to stop it, but in fact it actively continued to provide support, 
to the Houthi genocide on you know regime. I'll come back to that you know point in a second. Um, so so you know the the question that you ask is um, an application of to the case of humanitarian intervention of the more general question as to whether or not preventive war you know is morally justified. And I think that there are some cases you know where you know it is. Um, so let me. Be a bit more precise. It seems to me that um, there are cases in which a putative intervener has been given a just cause, you know, for intervening, such that if it were to intervene, it would not wrong it, or it would not violate the target, you know, communities or populations right to um, uh, conduct the domestic policy, you know, as they wish. Now, the claim that there is a just cause for war in general and intervention in particular, be it preemptive or not, is one thing. To say that the intervention or the war would be justified, all things considered, is a different claim together. So when you ask me, would it have been justified to intervene in Germany, you know, um, say in 1933, well, I'm pretty sure that, you know, there was a just cause, you know, for intervening. Um, you know, we, we knew, or we should have known, pretty shortly after Hitler's victory in 1932 and nominations chancellor in 1933, in the first, you know, two years or so, you know, of uh, his rule, I mean, it was pretty clear, again, to, you know, governments, you know, in the West, or what we now call the West, you know, what was likely to happen, whether it would have been all things considered justified. Well, I'm tempted to say yes, um, actually. I mean, you know, uh, we know um, that, and I think there was good reason to believe at the time, that Hitler was woefully underprepared in 1935, you know, 1936, uh, you know, compared to you know, the way things were in 1939, you know, 1940. So. Um, a quote that I found very interesting in your book. Um, so we, in being taught uh, political theory, uh, one of the very fundamental things you're told is that people um, elect their officials to represent them and um, they, the officials have... Yes. Uh, duty to represent people. So I quote from your book now, a regime which violates the fundamental rights of its members undermines the very rationale for its existence and for its claim to authority mm. and thus forfeits its immunity from interference in its conduct. Yeah. So yeah, I was just mentioning that because I find it really interesting that the people that are under a regime are under no obligation to always follow yeah. that regime and if the regime yeah. in some way uh, violates their rights, then they they will welcome some sort of intervention. Well, um, hang on. so, so th there might not. So, so this is complicated because, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, again, one of, one of the very difficult questions here, which, you know, goes back to the question of authority, as you raised it earlier in the context of subsistence wars, you know, is that um, we cannot infer from the fact that a population, you know, is oppressed, even very badly oppressed by its regime, that it would welcome the kind of assistance, military or not, actually, which we are willing, you know, to, um, you know, to provide. Uh, it certainly doesn't follow that we can, you know, intervene in any way we wish, just because we take ourselves to have, you know, the well-being of those people you know, at heart. And, you know, the, the case of Iraq 2003, I think, is a good illustration of that example. Even if um, it is true that there were humanitarian motivations, you know, for intervening, and I'm not entirely sure that there were, but, you know, even if there were, um, then what we learned, you know, with that case is the dangers of hubris you know, of thinking that just because we are in a position to help and just because we think that we need to do good, then the way we go about it, you know, is one which, um, you know, the, the regime's victims, you know, would consent to. That's a very good point. So we also have to think about whether 
the victim's consent. Yeah. And, uh, in order to do that, we might employ different, uh, we might imply that in uh, different ways, uh, it might be common sense or presumption. Um, and, uh, but we also have to think of the people of the affluent country that are not um, engaging in the war uh, actively. So, in, as you mentioned in uh, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, yeah. so the American government needs to be sure that Iraqi people, for example, consent to their intervention, yeah. uh, but they also have to think of the burden that Americans will will have. Yeah. Yeah, good. So, so, so I I agree that that is a consideration. Uh, now, let me go back to um, the example I gave earlier of um, uh, France's, which is my my home country, failure, you know, to intervene in Rwanda, you know, in 1994. Uh, now, I find that example, you know, interesting because um, uh, it points to. Um, a different justification for the duty of intervene, different, that is, from a justification that appeals to duties of good Samaritanism in general, and that is a justification that appeals to past wrongdoing. So in individual one-to-one in the cases, if I'm responsible for your predicament, um, then it seems to me that I'm under a prima facie duty to get you out of that in a predicament, and that even if there is a third party next to me who might be under a duty of good Samaritanism, you know, to get you out of that predicament, I might be the one to discharge that duty first. And if the duty has to be discharged by the two of us together, it stands to reason that by dint of my responsibility for the predicament, I ought to share, a, I ought to bear a greater share you know, of the costs. Mm -hmm. And I think that's related, you know, to the the example, the point that you've just made about the US administration having to think about the costs, you know, of intervening or, you know, the French government, you know, having to think about the costs for the French of intervening, you know, in Rwanda, namely that that consideration is weaker, it seems to me, or less of weight should be given to those costs you know, mm -hmm. when there is responsibility, you know, for that predicament than when there isn't. I mean, it's relatively simple in one-to-one -one cases. It's far more complicated in collective cases where we need to have a, an account of a political community such that the current generation, you know, can be held accountable, as it were, or liable, you know, to costs, you know, for what their predecessors you know, did. Um, so full account of this particular kind of justification for the duty to intervene, you know, would, would have to uh, take those particular problems into account. But the basic argument you know, is there. So do you think, following from that, uh, do you think there is any room for altruism here? This might be a very optimistic view of human nature, but we yeah. talk a lot of, uh, about countries have to think about the costs of intervening. Do you think someone could make a point that even if the costs outweigh the benefits of intervening in a country, uh, whether they be financial or loss of human lives, perhaps, that we still ought to intervene? Well, I mean, so it depends on how you construe the ought and... Um, and it depends on what you mean by and the weight you assign to, um, you know, the, the proposition, the cost of intervening outweigh the benefits. So just a few things to say there. First of all, I mean, I don't think that we are under a duty to intervene just when and only if, you know, the costs of intervening do not outweigh the benefits. It could be that the costs outweigh the benefits or that we would get no benefits the costs are relatively minimal and we might be under a duty to incur those costs. Then you have a case where the cost would be very high, such that we would not be under a duty to intervene. Then there is a further question as to whether or not we nevertheless may you know, intervene, should we so choose. And there might well be cases you know, where we may, whether we would, you know, whether 
you know, we, all of us together, and our governments, and those who support those governments, um, are sufficiently motivated to do that, I doubt it. You know, I'm not an optimist. You know, on the assumption that um, the upper bounds, as it were, of our motivations do not exhaust um, what we are morally permitted and obliged to do, then I would insist that we might sometimes be obliged to do you know, um, to embark on this particular course of action, and even if we are not, we might nevertheless be permitted to do so. Mm -hmm. So, there should also be a point made about uh, about the state of the country they intervene after after the intervention. Uh, for example, they cannot just intervene and change the regime and then just leave. So, what can we say about that? About maintaining or uh, securing the people have. Good. I guess, live in the long term. So that's the, that's the book that comes after this one, um, you know, Cosmopolitan Peace, where I have a chapter on you know, military occupation on the one hand, but also, well, I think it's more relevant, you know, to your question, uh, transitional foreign administrations, you know, on the other hand. I have, I have an argument, if there is a justification for the intervener to stay on after the war, you know, is over, to help you know, rebuild the country. There nevertheless are very strict conditions under which it taught to operate. An important one of which is that it should think of itself as having a time limited you know, mission you know, to help you know, rebuild. Um, so there's a longer argument you know, along those lines in the, in the uh, follow up volume you know, to this book. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I'll wait to read it. That's very kind of you to say that. It's longer than Cosmopolitan War, so it's a good help. <laughs> Some time. Good. And coming to my final question, um, in the book you mentioned the paradox of intervention, and that's, I quote from the book, the greater the degree of responsibility for rights violations, the weaker the case for assigning the duty to intervene to wrongdoers. Could you explain yeah, that? That's, that's good. So, so um, so it is true that, um, as I said earlier, there is a sense in which, you know, if you broke it, you are the one to fix it. Um, but of course, uh, in many cases of which, you know, this is one, um, the, the party who um, has the greatest share of responsibility, you know, for the outside party, which has the greatest share of responsibility, you know, for the rights violations, might also be the one that is the least trusted, you know, mm. on the grounds to mm. carry out, you know, the intervention. Um, and so much so that it would be counterproductive, you know, for that party, you know, to lead the intervention. And in fact, if it would be counterproductive, if, in other words, the intervention would not succeed, um, then there is a very strong moral reason you know, on the grounds that you may not inflict harm without a reasonable chance of success. Um, and so there, there's a very strong moral reason for not entrusting that party with the conduct of the intervention. It does not let that party completely off the hook. So as I suggested earlier in our conversation, intervention is costly, you know, in different ways. It's costly in human resources. Uh, it's also financially costly. So go back to France. Um, even if it is the case that France would not have been trusted enough in Rwanda in 1994, in April 1994, to conduct an intervention at the outset of the genocide by sending French troops, it might still be the case that France ought to have borne, and Belgium ought to have borne the land's share of the financial costs you know, of the intervention. So it's something which, um, when I did the research for that chapter of the book, it's something which I noticed, um, you, you know, pe people didn't really um, distinguish, you know, between you know, different ways in which, or between the different kinds of costs which we have to incur uh, when we wage a war. Thanks, that makes good sense now. Good. So, Professor Fabre, would really like to thank you for your participation. Thank you for having me. It was, uh, it was fun and interesting. So good luck. And thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Likewise. You have just listened to Premise Podcast. Subscribe to Premise Podcast on YouTube.
and make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter and Facebook. The podcast is also available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Please consider supporting Premise Podcast on Patreon to help bring philosophy to the public. Thanks for listening.